This is 91.3 FM, WCUW in Worcester, Massachusetts, the Dr. Chris Radio of Horror program. And tonight on the Radio of Horror, from First Person Shooter, a well-known New England photographer who hits almost every convention in the sick, in, the, in, in all the states of New England, we have Rodney on the show with us. Rodney Brown, thank you for coming on the show with us. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks for having me. What is this upcoming cosplay photography expo that uh, you had mentioned on Facebook? So uh, CAPE, as we uh, abbreviate it so that it's a lot easier for people to say, is the Cosplay and Photography Expo, something we started last year uh, and something we've been actually tossing around since I started as uh, Editor-in-Chief of Nerd Caliber, which is another thing I do. Um, the idea that we wanted to create a convention that was as much about people learning how to do what we love to celebrate cosplay uh, and the photography of cosplay as uh, other cons celebrate celebrity essentially uh, and so the focus is entirely about learning how to do things uh, how to make things with crafting for cosplay how to do different types of photo shoots uh, photoshops and uh, lightroom skills um, anything that you can think of about either being a better cosplayer, uh, uh, and particularly a crafter of cosplay, uh, and uh, being a better photographer. Um, so that's basically the, the short, uh, not so short, short version. And when does it take place? This upcoming one is... Um, is that the same weekend? <laughs> that's not the same weekend as the Boston Comic Con, is it? No, it's the weekend before, which is uh, uh, August 6th and 7th. I'm sorry, that's what it is. August 6th and 7th. Uh, it's at Stonehill College in Easton, Mass., which is really handy because last year we were at a hotel in Southbridge, beautiful hotel, great location, fantastic facilities, but no public transit access on the weekends. No, no. Southbridge is really out there. It, it's really out there. Uh, this is a lot closer to Boston. Uh, it's basically the commuter rail into Brockton and then a bus ride right to the, co the college's front gates. Uh, very easy to get to. Um, and we're expanding it to two days this year. Last year, since it was our first con, we did it just a single day. This year, we're going up to two days, two panel rooms instead of one, so we'll actually have four times the number of panels. Why do you think this cosplay thing has, like, exploded like it has? Like, I mean, the uh, people showed up in cosplay, and it was cool and all, but it wasn't like this thing at conventions like it is today. I think partly what it was was that nobody dared, or few people dared. And but what I mean by that is that the people who were cosplaying were those people who were really completely dedicated to wanting to express their appreciation of the fandom. They wanted to dress up like the characters they really loved. They were probably more fanatical about that fandom than the average cosplayer is today, which is not to say that the average cosplayer today isn't a big fan. But there were a lot of other considerations in their life that may have presented or prevented them from doing that, from dressing up, from making that particular kind of expression. And frankly, I think a lot of it was peer pressure, societal pressure, and so on. Even super fans of you know, comic books or gaming or whatever, 10 years ago might look at a cosplayer and go, hey, you know, I dress up like that and, and you know, people at work are just going to give me you know, an endless amount of grief. As the sort of greater acceptance of nerd culture and, and ultimately, realistically, the complete dominance of nerd culture in culture around everywhere has happened. That thought of peer pressure, which frankly I don't think really was there at the time, has moved aside. And more people realize that they can do what they've wanted to do all along, which is join those really fanatical people in dressing up and, and expressing how much they love the particular fandoms. Which convention do you think it really kind of exploded at? Wow. I don't, I don't know that I would say one in particular. Um, so the first thing that pops into my head is Dragon Con, because Dragon Con, uh, th there's nothing like the sheer amount, variety, uh, and nature of cosplay that you see at Dragon Con. But Dragon Con is still quite a bit more isolated and insular from the general convention community than anything else out there. Um, it's not like New York Comic Con where uh, you're expecting a whole bunch of people who might be showing up 
just because they want to buy you know something that's in some vendor's long box of, of comics or uh, some sort of you know early release or, or uh, particular exclusive figure uh, from a game that they really like but could care less about cosplay uh, Dragon is really heavily focused on on cosplay and and the largest convention of what I might say is that that first group of truly fanatical cosplayers and, and members of a fandom out there. So I'm not sure that that's a nece- necessarily a, 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 the right place to say it's where it started to become more mainstream. If anything, it might be San Diego Comic-Con or Comic-Con International, as they like to be called nowadays. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> oh, yeah, that, 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 that good old chestnut of, we're really Comic-Con, you can't call yourselves Comic-Con, we're going to sue you, and they did. And they did, and they <laughs> lost, and so that's why they are now Comic-Con International, and, and that's trademarked. They can have it. You know, the idea of suing anybody who puts together the words Comic and Con into you know any combination was clearly ludicrous and, and never went anywhere for them. They must God. have gotten that idea from when, like, you know, Marvel was suing everyone for using the word Marvel in their character's name, like Captain Marvel. <laughs> everybody, everybody has tried doing that on the recommendation. Every large company, let's say, or a large organization has tried doing that on the recommendation of some overzealous, you know, uh, idiot lawyer. Uh, Beating their chest. Exactly. Who thinks that, you know, every single aspect of their IP needs to be protected without realizing the damage to the IP that that kind of uh, lawsuit can actually bring about. But that's an aside. <laughs> Getting back, I think, it, I think it really was San Diego Comic-Con, and I think that's because as the nerd culture started growing into the general culture, more and more venues started covering... San Diego Comic Con. One because it was pretty local to the, you know, the heart of the entertainment community, uh, and two, the mainstream entertainment media started bringing their products to San Diego, the big movies, and so there were cosplayers wandering around as people were doing the coverage. They'd go, "Hey, this is pretty interesting," and they would start doing at first just quick little segments about, "Hey, look at all these weird people walking around in costume." And then they go, hey, look at all these pretty cool people walking around in costume. And then entire segments about here's the best cosplay at San Diego Comic-Con in mainstream cover. So if I had to put one con as, as being more responsible for the growth of cosplay a, as a more mainstream thing, it, it would have to be San Diego. Do you think that was also like a big thing of that was the stereotype that women aren't involved in like sci-fi gaming and comic books and they see these women who look like supermodels dressed up as wonder woman and she hulk and so on and so forth and that starts drawing more and more people into the culture of cosplay possibly but i think more and we're talking like average people who have nine to five jobs who are not supermodels but look like supermodels in their cosplay Yes, let me, it's quite possible that uh, you know your average heterosexual male, or certainly your lesbian female, could have looked at some of those people and gone, "Wow, this is really interesting. Let's see what this is all about." Uh, I, I don't doubt that at all. I, I think the question raises a, a bigger problem with what happened as this became more popular, and that is that so many people didn't understand the difference between the professional level looking uh, model looking amateur cosplayers who just did it for fun and uh, what are called booth babes. I mean paid models who are wearing costumes that were created by somebody and and are there repping a booth. Yeah like a video game coming out and they need like they need like this alien creature who looks hot represented at their booth. Right. Now, nowadays, you'll find that that's almost always done by inviting a cosplayer to do it, uh, and usually inviting the cosplayer to make the costume. Yes. You see um, those ads pop up on job sites everywhere, like Craigslist is a big place. Around the time coming close to a convention like PAX East, you'll start seeing uh, video game companies posting on Craigslist saying, hey, we need you know, the representatives, and we need models, and so on and so forth. And, and I think that's a great thing, because what it's done is essentially – not completely, but certainly with nerd cons, eliminated the idea of the professional model, and therefore the you know wearing a costume that they did not make, 
and know nothing about, uh, which was what an awful lot of people early on who did come into appreciation of cosplay by saying, oh, wow, look at those hot models. What's this all about? Started uh, thinking in their unfortunately incorrect you know, thought patterns that you know, these hot people don't know what they're doing. And for the most part, that was wrong. Uh, yes, if they were a paid model that was hired in one of the major cities that has access to a lot of paid models and a lot of people who can craft costumes for them, so essentially just San Diego and just New York, they might have, 10 years ago, been completely ignorant of what they were wearing and, and the, you know, the fandom that they represented that was the 1% of people that were standing around at a booth at that time, and the 99% of people who were walking around in the costumes knew exactly what they were doing. Unfortunately, an awful lot of people, mostly guys, in fact, entirely guys, uh, got it into their head that everybody who was walking around in, in costumes, every woman who was walking around in costumes, knew nothing about what they were doing. That they were essentially those paid models. And that was stupid then it's completely ignorant now because it's so not the case uh, it, as you just said any con will advertise or anybody who's uh, vending or exhibiting at a con will advertise for somebody to actually make and wear the costume representing their game their comic their whatever at that con and cosplayers will flock to it so those people who are at the booths nowadays are in fact huge fans of what's being represented. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's amazing how quickly and stupidly something like that can grow to an idea when it was wrong at the beginning, almost entirely, and is completely wrong now. What is your, in your, your expert opinion, the top 10 best cosplays you've seen in the models who have represented it, male or female? Oh, man. Oh, <laughs> You, you know that's an impossible question. Um, <laughs> okay, how about this? The last, how about the best five you've seen over the last maybe uh, three months of conventions you've gone to, from Katsukon to Rhode Island Comic Con to Aresia? All right, I'm going to start right <laughs> off by saying I apologize to anybody I'm forgetting. Okay. Because I guarantee that I am going to probably the minute this interview is over go, oh, damn it, why didn't I say that one and that one and that one and that one and that one? It's, just just so five many. off your head. It, I mean, let, let, let's eliminate the, the question of, like, the best. And just say, like, five that really stood up to you off the top of your head. And that way no one can be like, but he said I was so awesome. All right. That, that's easier to do. And because that way I can key on uh, what really gets my fanboy going. <laughs> okay. For me, it's something either completely unexpected, something completely rare, uh, or... Uh, just a, a really amazing mashup um, or a really funny mashup so most recently probably would be Aresia and there was a gentleman walking around in a perfect version of number two from the n late 1960s British television series The Prisoner if you don't know what that is, it would mean nothing to you as, as a guy my age who was a huge fan of The Prisoner when it first came out, the original series with Patrick McGowan, not that awful remake they did a few years ago. They did that um, with, uh, the remake was with uh, the guy who played Jesus Christ, right? Uh, yeah, Jim Caviezel. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, he's great. I, I love him, but wow, that, that remake was just stupid. Um, but the original series with Patrick McGowan was fantastic. Uh, who people nowadays may remember as Edward Longshanks from uh, Braveheart. Um, ah. Yes, that guy. Uh, off, horrible villain, or actually great villain, uh, but he was a hero in this thing uh, of sorts. <laughs> but anyway, that, so there were so few people at that con would have even got what he was, and even so, I thought he was actually the prisoner. Uh, and he turned around and he had a number two badge on his shirt, and I was like, oh, okay, that's even better. Um, so that kind of really super rare cosplay does it for me. Uh, similarly, at Dragon Con last year, um, there was a guy who walked by me, and I just, just literally shouted out. Uh, he was Viv from The Young Ones, the old MTV series. Um, with the, they were fake, of course, but with the you know metal star studs in his forehead, 
uh, and the safety pins in his cheeks and, and it, the whole nine yards had it perfect just amazing um, let's see what else really blew my mind um, gosh there was a lot of really good stuff at Rhode Island uh, so much that there was a guy there were a lot because the 501st uh, was there in force both New England and the Connecticut garrisons and so there were an awful lot of Star Trek Star Trek sorry 501st you're going to kill me Star Wars cosplayers um, there was a guy that was Darth Maul that was perfect yeah, I think I remember that. Oh, he was an amazing Darth Maul. Uh, I don't know if I ever saw him do any martial arts work, but he certainly knew how to wield the you know double-sided lightsaber and had the scary look down pat. Um, let's see. What else would really, really stand out? Yeah, again, people are going to give me a hard time because I'm not highlighting them now. Um, you know what I never see? I never see anybody from a Ralph Bakshi animated movie. And I'm not, and you can't count Lord of the, you cannot count the Hobbit or any of the Lord of the Rings films because, I mean, those are done, you know, based on the movies or, or for the books or whatever. But anything that it was original creation by Ralph Bakshi, I never see anyone do anything from that. I don't know any uh, original creation. I have seen... Um, I mean, like, if you wanted to do, let's say, Tigra from Fire and Ice, I mean, that's a girl in a purple bikini. That's not really a costume. You know well, what I, I mean? I, seen, <laughs> I think I've seen pictures of. I don't know that I actually have seen this myself. A guy doing... Uh, uh, what's the wolf guy? The guy with the wolf uh, mask in Fire and Ice. Um, uh, anyway, I can, wh whatever, whoever he is, I've seen pictures of somebody cosplaying that. I have seen pictures of somebody cosplaying um, the Kim Basinger uh, character from Cool World. Hollywood. Hollywood. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, Brad Pitt character you know, in the, the white, you know, very pale suit, whatever it was. Um, yeah, I guess without her, without him cosplayed as that, you could, you could easily also say that she was, you know, possibly Emma Frost or something. Or, or yeah. Marilyn Monroe, or the, depending yeah, on Mar yeah, or Marilyn Monroe, because I've seen women like walking around like that, and I didn't know what the you know I was like, oh, that must be Marilyn Monroe or something like that. One and of the giveaways is the hair up in that sort of big loose bun with a couple of strands coming down the side. Yeah, that's that's a giveaway that would you know uh, make you know that it's certainly not uh, Marilyn Monroe. Somebody did a great Bella Lugosi once, and they were they 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 body painted their face and hands to make it look like they were in black and white. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, like they had like um, gray, it was like gray body paint or something like that because it's not really black and white. It's like gray and gray, black and white. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen the local Gotham villains that do, you know, their black and white versions of uh, um, of the Gotham, well, villains. Yes, basically. yes. Uh, very good. They, they do a great job. Yeah, I saw a, a, a black and white version of Batman that looked really cool, whatever. Like, the, t the like it wasn't a completely black costume. It was like a grayish kind of black costume, which then I got was like, oh, he's doing a black and white kind of thing. You know, like, without color. That's so awesome. Um, uh, you know what I love going to is conventions as, and this is my own ego, is I'll go to conventions. I know there's not going to be a lot of other people dressed as characters from Supernatural, and I'll be Castiel. And a lot of attention will come my way. Yeah. And I, I, a, I love Supernatural. I love the character of Castiel. But I'm also not going to lie and say that I don't dress as a character because the attention is kind of cool. Especially when you go into a con that you know there's not going to be a lot of other people there as those characters. But then fans will recognize you and you know have their kind of like fangirl boy moment. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of people. Uh, it's less common now, but uh, years ago there were a lot of people who who tried to state very loudly that they were they were never dressing up to get the thrill of being recognized. Um, and there's nothing even, wrong with the, the thrill of being recognized, you know? In well, fact, I go to a convention these days, I feel bad that I'm not in cosplay. <laughs> well, personally, I agree with that, and, and I think that anybody who's ever said that is being, to some extent, disingenuous. Um, you want everyone loves attention, it, especially if it's good, good, good attention. You know what I mean? It's it's not bad to, to want attention. <laughs> well, I think part of the problem was that people were thinking they were talking about different kinds of attention. Oh, and that so yes. Was automatically assuming that it was attention because of 
their looks, because of their sexuality, because of whatever. Um, and they were trying to say, I, you know, I only do it because I want, you know, to know that I've accomplished something great. It's like, well, then look at yourself in a mirror and don't bother going to a con. You know, you really have to admit that you want other people to recognize that you've done something great. Maybe you don't like the fact that people look at you and think, you know, oh, you look awesome, beautiful, whatever, in that costume that you really just want them to look at the craftsmanship. But you still want them to look at that. You still want that attention and that recognition of what you've done. Um, and, uh, again, luckily, enough people have come to realize that that's really the case. Uh, that, you know, they don't that they do crave attention of some kind or recognition at least of some kind uh that uh, that's no longer as much of an issue or at least you don't see it out there in the social media as much as you used to when people uh, that that brings up an interesting point um with uh, with everything that you've seen and and you've been in this you've been doing this for uh what like 10 15 years oh gosh no uh, longer I have the first con that I went to with the intention of taking photos of cosplayers was 2008 uh, it was you know what it, it, the first con I went to and took pictures of cosplayers was anime Boston 2008 and that was because I was there to interview MC front a lot for the paper I worked for it, it had nothing to do with going there for any other purpose, but I saw all these amazing people walking around in costume and went, wait a minute, I'm missing something. That was my first Anime Boston, too. Well, there you go. Yeah. Actually, uh, I've been going to cons kind of... My, my con experience started about 2007. I went to one con in 2004 and, and six, and it was just Rock and Chalk. It was the same convention, but it was 2007. I started on this whole, like, you know... Well, I, well, first of all, I started doing Radio of Horror, so that naturally, you know, kind of went in with, like, going to more conventions. I went to BotCon and Rock and Chalk, and then the first Bo Boston Comic Con happened in 2008 in the basement of that uh, hotel out in the middle of Boston before they became like this, you know, huge thing, or we got like, you know, however many thousands of people come to it now. Uh, I'm not sure what their numbers are now. It's uh, it's it's 30, it's 30s, unbelievable. Uh, but yeah, it, I didn't catch that first one. I caught the second one where they moved to the Weston. Uh, oh yeah, that was a uh, 2010. Yeah, that was 2010 because yeah. they were doing two cons a year in 2008 and nine, and then they moved to the Weston. They were so huge they could only do one con. And then, um, then they were like they were, they were at the Westin, and then they moved to the the building that the Anime Boston happens in, and that was still too big for them, and that was still too small for them. So then they moved over to where they are now. Not, well, I'm just gonna. It's that's not exactly the way it happened. Um, they were actually never uh, big enough to completely fill the Hines. Uh, if you look at the last year that they were there before the bombing. Uh, they two. only had one of the two potential uh, spaces that Anime Boston actually fills up, both of them, on that first floor uh, for vendor areas. Yep. Uh, um, so they never actually filled up uh, the Heinz and grew too large for it. The reason they moved uh, was because of the bombing, and they have wound up discovering that they liked the seaport better. Um, so that's why they've stuck with the seaport. Um but um, with all these cosplayers that you see and, and all of the work that, you know, all the pictures that you've taken, when, when um, th there's, a, uh, there's a conversation that comes up sometimes with, with cosplayers I've had on my show saying that, you know, they're, um, they understand that, like, you know, there's certain amounts of bad attention that certain, like, this is mostly about females, uh, female cosplayers get that they don't want. And, you know, um, they are strong enough to handle it themselves, but their advice to female cosplayers who don't want the negative attention is to don't quite put yourself out there in a position or in a costume that's going to get you the wrong type of attention if you can't, you know, if you don't have the, you know, the strong enough personality to handle it or something like that. Um, and these were, you know, these are a couple of, uh, cosplayers I've had on that have like, you know, their boyfriend with them. They've been doing it for a while. They know, they know how the, you know, the, everything works. They're not, you know, they're not afraid or intimidated. 
Um, but, you know, they meet other cosplayers that have these problems with, you know, certain people, um, you know, stalkers, if that's what we want to call them. And, you know, they, they look at what they're wearing and how they are and, and what their personality is. And they're putting themselves in a position that it's coming on to them in the really negative way. Not that that's right, but, you know, there are certain things they can do to change that that they're not doing. Okay. Would you and, agree? Uh, uh, would I agree to say you have to be tough skinned to do it? Uh, it's like anything where you put yourself out there. Yes. You know, uh, I am f pretty tough skinned. You know, people can tell me my photography sucks, and I'm like, okay, fine. That's, you know, that's your opinion. I personally think that my photography is average ish. You know, I, there are people I admire just would die to have their eye, their ability for composition, for structure, you know, th th their technical skills. So if I put my stuff out there, I'm obviously opening myself up to criticism of, you know, oh, that was bad, that was wrong, why did you even put that up there? And if I weren't of my age uh, and of my experience and so on, I might have a real hard time with that. I, I certainly, in my 20s, I probably would have a very, very hard time with that. Now I think about it. Um, so I can see why that's a, a, a bit of advice that would get out there. The, the problem is I hate the idea that that advice even has to happen. Um, and the more people put themselves out there, the more it becomes less acceptable for people to do things like dump on them for, uh, for anything I'm not 100% a fan of the idea that you shouldn't comment on somebody's work. If they're putting their work out there, then it's open for comment. But I'm also very, very much a big fan of the idea that you should never dump on somebody's work just for the sake of dumping on it. You know, if you didn't particularly care for a way, the way a, a cosplay was made or the way a person represented that cosplay or that character... That's your opinion, and, and you know, feel free to share it you know, among your friends, but you know, there's no reason to dump on that cosplayer. If you have valuable constructive criticism to bring to them, you, know, you can mention that you have it, and if they you know, invite you to share it, then you know, share it. If they don't invite you to share it, don't be a jerk and shut up. You know, it's, it's pretty simple. I, I want more people to put themselves out there so that this does not become an issue that it fades and fades as a problem uh, in the community that said I understand 100% why there are people who wouldn't want to uh, there are jerks jerks exist uh, there are worse than jerks uh, and some of the most storied and, and uh, recognized cosplayers I know have their stories of people that are worse than jerks. Uh, you know, the people that rise to the level of police calls. Uh, and that's just sad. Uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, the nature of any kind of celebrity. And, you know, for those people who don't like that term when associated with cosplay, sorry if you have enough people who know you solely for what you do within that particular community, you're a celebrity. Except the word. There's no other way to talk talk about it. Um, that's just the nature of you know what happens with celebrity. You know, you're going to get attention, and some minor subset of that attention is going to be pretty awful. Yeah, ab yes, ab absolutely. On to a more positive note, uh, what? Do, how many cons do you think you do a year? Oh gosh! I just keep hitting you with the tough questions, huh? <laughs> that, well, that one isn't tough. That's just a matter of math. But I don't know if I want to waste your time adding it up. It, it it at least averages one a month. So I would say I think I did fifteen ish last year. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe a little bit more than that. Maybe sixteen to eighteen. Um, do you do a lot of horror conventions? Uh, I don't. But uh, I've gotten to more of them now that some more local ones have cropped up. And I understand Rock and Shock is local. I just never knew about it uh, because I came into cons from you know the comic book uh, and comic convention side uh, and anime anime Boston. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, although at the time I knew nothing about it. You should hook up with a guy named Jeremy Schaefer. He uh, Safer. He uh, does uh, like he's like the rock metal horror uh, photographer guy. Cool. I'll yeah. Have to look him up. Yes. Um, but uh, I so I've done um, Terrorcon, uh, which is coming back, which is very cool. It, it, um, it is when. Oh, I'd have to look it up. I've it's I've heard it. Uh, I know it's happening. I just don't know if they. I do. I I actually you know I remember them posting about it like last year in October saying Terracon something's happening, and that yeah August as of their Facebook page August thirty first two thousand fifteen was their last announcement. Yeah. But that was yeah. the death of Wes Craven. That had nothing to do with the con. They posted on Twitter. Okay, that's where it was. Now I just found it. It was on Twitter. It was in October saying, big announcement coming soon. Yeah, Haven't heard that, anything yet. <laughs> that may have been where I heard about it. And, you know, other... It's saying uh, summer of 2016 they're returning. And everyone I've talked to about it is like, yeah, I, I remember seeing that post too. They're not on any schedule block for summer of 2016. So when are they coming back? Because every con for 2016 has got their block already set up. They have yeah. no block. I'm assuming it won't be this coming summer, uh, but I know it will. they will be coming back. And I'm assuming that the reason it's not, and for you people who know about this, again, I apologize if I'm wrong, uh, is that the people who run Terracon wound up uh, also sort of merging with, buying into um, uh, Hartford Comic-Con becoming, or merging with Comic-Con and becoming Hartford Comic-Con, C-O-N-N. And so... But they're run by the Rhode Island Comic-Con. Hmm? The the Terracon's run by the Rhode Island Comic-Con. Same people. Yeah. Uh, Altered Reality did Terracon and Rhode Island and Hartford and are now... And Hartford has now merged with Comic-Con, and therefore their resources may be focused on making this combined Hartford Comic-Con, Comic-Con bigger and, and you, know, uh, you know, the kind of hit that it needs to be in Hartford to keep going. Gotcha. Uh, that's pure speculation on my part, but that would be why I would guess that the number of, uh, or that no big announcement has been made about Terracon, but I am fairly confident that it is coming back. But anyway... Uh, and that and Walker Soccer in Boston, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, that I've never are... gone to just based on... Uh, uh, it's pricey. Yeah, prices. It, it, it's got to do yeah. with pricing. And, and people I talk to have been like, yeah, that was fun, but I'm completely broke now for the next several months. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's the... Uh... That's that's constantly what I'm hearing. And then there's uh, the Scaracon is coming um, in Springfield in June. They're a traveling convention. I haven't heard about that. I'll have to look that one up, too. Yeah, they're uh, Scare something or another. I've not had a lot of luck. Scaracon, New England. Um, I don't know much about them. They have one guest announced. Uh, I, f- I, I think, yeah, it's C. Thomas Howell. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's kind of a horror guy. Um, I swear to God, I hope they're not trying to bring back Linda Blair because there was some talk about Linda Blair, and I was just like, oh, my God, did anyone go to Terracon when Linda Blair was at Terracon? That was a horrible (laughs) experience. I had this cute little 13-year-old goth girl at my table who my my co-host had was sitting next to her at the Q&A, and uh, Linda Blair gave her, like, a public chewing over her question, and she was at our table afterwards almost in tears about how horrified she was and never wanting to ask a question in a and a again. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's pretty bad. I, my only experience with her was when she uh, sort of introduced the, I think it was the costume contest uh, pre-party, uh, and, uh, you know, she was fine then, but then again, she was on her game, and she was just presenting. She wasn't interacting, so... Um, yeah, so I'll check out Scaricon. That sounds uh, pretty cool. But I haven't hit too many of the the you know the uh, horror cons. Uh, I did get a lot of really great uh, photos out of Terracon, though. Uh, there was a lot of really good stuff there. Um, not all just zombies, <laughs> which <laughs> Walker Stalker is essentially just zombies. Yes. The uh, the pictures you sent me of uh, Freddy versus the Ash guy that that looks really cool. But I couldn't figure out what, who was in the second picture. Is that Lollipop Chainsaw with some girl? Uh, yeah, that's basically the, these uh, two cosplayers uh, who are friends wanted to recreate the idea of you know um, if uh, Juliet Starling's one of her high school friends had been bitten by uh, a zombie and 
they were essentially trying to hide and deal with the fact that the girl's about to turn, you know, and you know, how do they handle that? Um, so that was a cool shoot. That was, uh, you know, we went to a friend of mine who was doing a lot of rehab on a, an apartment house that he had. So it was pretty old, pretty distressed, pretty vacant. Uh, looked great for the zombie shoot. Yeah, like, like like one of her arms, she's got some great makeup on. Looks like she's bruised on her arm and uh, and stuff like that. So and, yeah, and, uh, and you can't see in the back side of that. She did an amazing job of doing a because the cosplayer who is the high school friend. Uh, is in fact works in making um, <laughs> what's the term uh, accurate medical injuries for training for EMTs and so on. So she essentially makes things that look like people were torn up, you know, bones sticking out, things like that. So she had a very cool tear right behind that shoulder bruise uh, and a bite that you could see through the tear, but that. The, angle of that shot doesn't show it it just shows the bruising expanding forward biggest thing that caught my attention gorgeous women in horror settings that's you know always the thing in the horror industry that you can't ever go wrong with that nope you? nope 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 <laughs> my opinion there is no ugly women in the horror industry you know yeah yeah I, uh, you know, when you get right down to it you know Unless you're dead or a zombie, then you know that's that's a whole other thing. But yeah, if you, if you unless, look, unless, you're, unless you're the actress from Throw Mama from a Train, you know other than that. If, you, if you're looking at you know <laughs> some of the uh, zombies in uh, The Walking Dead, there's pretty much no way to describe somebody beautiful if their lower jaw is missing. <laughs> so. Is there disgusting things that happen in women in horror movies? Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. Or just too too horrifying to. To, to think about, like, like Cabin Fever 2, you know, or Cabin Fever. <laughs> and they're, they're, I cannot believe they remade Cabin Fever. The movie is not even, like, 10 years old, and the remake's already out. Really? Yes. They, oh, that's you, just, uh, that's stupid. Yes, there is Cabin Fever 1 and 2 and 0, which is, like, the prequel to the first one. And right. then there is, yeah, there's a Cabin Fever remake, and it's already out. <laughs> that's, that's, that's awful. And why it's like, you? why... Why do we need more nightmares of women shaving the skin off their legs? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've met that woman. <laughs> yeah, you know, see, I would love to see more movies like um, Cabin in the Woods that take horror tropes and turn them on their heads. Um, and particularly with a focus on the idea that, you know, uh, you know the women are generally in the horror movies the victim some uh, people don't like cabin in the woods because they feel like josh whedon was uh patronizing the horror industry and like oh. making it seem like horror fans were stupid and dumb and just like having to explain the you know what i mean every detail to them like they so, were just not intelligent enough to figure it out themselves and i have some friends that are like really against cabin in the woods in fact so they're really against most josh whedon stuff because that's what he does all the time so do you think those same people would object to Scream? Uh, no. One of these two people that I'm speaking of likes Scream a lot. And the other Scream one's a director. Scream is exactly the same thing. It takes horror tropes and makes them essentially a joke, except that the people who ultimately are making the joke turn out, spoiler alert, to be the ones who are committing the horrible acts. True. Um, but there's no difference whatsoever except that, you know, you don't get the the snark and the smarm that you get with a Joss Whedon. It's exactly the same idea. You know, let's look at horror tropes and let's do something to sort of twist that. Scream and, and Cabin in the Woods are the same thing in that sense. So take that, haters. <laughs> Uh, where can people find out more information about you or if they want to book you for something or, or like meet you at a con and get their picture taken and stuff like that? Uh, well, uh, on Facebook, I'm First Person Shooter. That's uh, spelled out uh, first person as one word and shooter as a sep separate word. Uh, because I'm the editor-in-chief of Nerd Caliber, I actually don't take paid bookings. I, I would consider that a uh, journalistic conflict of interest. Uh, I do do some shoots uh, outside of cons or even at cons if I have the time uh, for friends and people who, you know, ask me because they've got an amazing thing I've never seen before. But uh, if I'm at a con, 
lately or going forward, we will have tables uh, promoting CAPE, the Cosplay and Photography Expo. Uh, we'll have a table at Anime Boston in the Con Row. Last year we were the very first table. I don't think we'll get that again this year, but fingers crossed. Uh, we've actually paid for uh, a big booth at um, uh, Spring Super Mega Fest, so we'll be there. Cool. I'll uh, be there. Both of those locations will have, uh, like I did at Anime Boston, backdrop lights. Come by, get your shots. Shots will go up on Nerd Caliber. Everybody's happy. Uh, and we'll be showing you what's going to happen with some of the panels at Capes by having panelists sitting at the table uh, and talking about some of the cool stuff that they, they do, they make, they shoot. Generally, uh, you can also see uh, any of my galleries that I shoot at a con are going to be up on Nerd Caliber, so mm -hmm. nerdcaliber.com. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. I'm on Twitter at uh, Burley underscore adopter, uh, which is a holdover for when I was covering tech, uh, but it's still too cool a name to drop. What's that Twitter handler again? Uh, Burley underscore adopter. Spell it for us. B-U-R-L-Y. B-U-R-L-Y. Uh, underscore, I'm not going to spell out because it's actually the underscore. And yes. A-D-O-P-T-E-R. <laughs> Cool, gotcha. All right, so you can find him on Twitter and Facebook, and don't forget to. You also have a calendar. I saw. A cal Well, we're starting to. I've created a calendar on Nerd Caliber. Um, With. Oh, you mean a calendar for sale? You, don't you have a calendar for sale? I, I thought I had a link to that. I don't have it anymore, but it's all. Uh, am I wrong? And I'll let this part out. The um, zealots.com or something. I do have a calendar for sale, Zazzle, I believe. Zazzle, okay. Is yeah. it is it all women in the calendar? Yeah, it's all it's all boudoir shots. Okay, that's okay. That's what, okay. I thought it was yours. For, for a minute, yeah. I wasn't sure if that was yours or not. But they're all women. Um, they're all uh, models and um. They're all models. They're not cosplayers. Actually, some of them do cosplay, but they're not. You know, it's not cosplay boudoir. It's just straight up boudoir. Yes, because selling a, selling a uh, calendar of, of cosplay models in their cosplay, which are all copywritten by various companies, could probably be a whole entire legal mess, I'm assuming. Uh, it could be, but actually there are plenty of people who do it, uh, including cosplayers. So, it, you know, it falls into the gray area of if you make too much money at it, we're going to come after you. Like that Star Trek fan film. <laughs> like the Star Trek fan film, like the Jane hat, like, you know, yeah, if, if you know, people are making too much money at it, somebody's going to get worried about it, but frankly, most of the people I know who are uh, selling calendars, whether they're the cosplayers themselves or whether they are a website, it's never been an issue. Gotcha. Cool. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rodney, for coming on the show with us. We look forward to seeing you at the next convention, which seems like it's probably going to be Super Mega Fest, unless you go to PAX East. Uh, we'll be at PAX East, but for, before then, uh, Anime Boston is before then, right? It's end of March. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will definitely be. I will be at PAX East, uh, and Nerd Caliber will be at PAX East uh, in force as well. And then in uh, April, later April, I believe, uh, I think the week after PAX East, or two weeks after PAX East, is the uh, Marlboro Super Mega Fest. Yes, yes. Yeah, run by my good man, John. Yeah, they were uh, really good to us uh, in the last couple of years, and, and particularly last year. And uh, now that we have a booth there, uh, we're just going to really kick it up a notch with uh, promoting CAPE. Um, so, oh, by the way, just to look, you can get to CAPE at cape.nerdcaliber.com. Oh, okay, yes, good. Uh, or you can just go to the Cosplay and Photography Expo Facebook page. Awesome. Thank you again so much, Rodney, for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure to see you at every single convention that we've run into you at, usually across from a booth that we've had. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me on, Dr. Chris, and I will see you at the next one.